Chapter 11, The Overview of the Denticians. Dentition is the term used to describe the natural teeth in the jaw bones. The dental assistant must know the names, locations, and functions of the teeth. The dental assistant must also understand the various systems of numbering teeth. We, we will talk about the different numbering systems um, a little bit later in the PowerPoint. However, the most universal one um, that we use, you're, you're probably, the dentists are not pro probably not going to use any other one. Um, it's going to be the one, two, three, four. That's the most common one that you'll hear, except, of course, if it's um, baby teeth, primary teeth, because those don't go by numbers, they go by letters. So dentition periods, although there are only two sets of teeth, there are three dentition periods. It's the primary, it's mixed, and there's permanent. So the primary dentition is the first set of 20 primary teeth. It's called the primary dentition. The dentition is commonly referred to as the baby teeth or the milk teeth. You may also hear the term deciduous dentition, an older and less frequently used dental term to describe the primary dentition. You will hear that every once in a while, deciduous. So you need to know the definition of it. Mixed dentition. Mixed dentition generally occurs between the ages of 6 and 12 because you know that the first molar um, is also called the six-year molar, and that's actually one of the first posterior teeth, uh, first permanent posterior teeth that you will see in uh, children. And it usually, they usually come about at about the age of 6. And the age of 12 is usually when they lose their canines, which those are uh, usually the last teeth that they lose. And so between the ages six of 12, that's why it's called mixed dentition, because that's like the transitioning period where they go from all baby teeth, some baby teeth and some permanent teeth, and then all permanent teeth. So both primary and permanent teeth are present during this transitional period. The mixed dentition period begins with the eruption of the first permanent tooth, which is a permanent mandibular first molar. This period ends with shedding of the last primary tooth. So permanent dentition, the final or adult dentition. This period begins with shedding of the last primary tooth. Growth of the jaw bones slowly and event slows and eventually stops. There is very little growth of the jaw overall during this period because puberty has passed. So dental arches. We both know that the maxillary arch, which is the upper arch, which is usually part of the skull, is fixed and not capable of movement. The teeth are set in the maxilla bone. So you guys know that when you chew, when you do the chewing action, only your lower, your lower jaw is moving. Your upper jaw does not move because that's attached to your skull. The mandibular arch, which is the lower, is capable of movement through the action of the temporal mandibular joint. The mandible is the bone that supports the lower arch of teeth, hence named mandibular arch. So the way that you re can remember these two is that max. I always think about max, like that's the top. If something is at its max, it means it cannot go any higher. It's already at the top. So that's how I remember that maxillary arch means upper and then mandibular arch means lower because the mandible is at the bottom. So occlusion is the natural contact between the maxillary and mandibular teeth in all positions. So when you close your mouth and, you, and all your teeth are touching, this is called occlusion. Hence why um, the posterior teeth, uh, you know, it's posterior teeth. So the chewing surface, what is the chewing surface called in posterior teeth? Anybody? Okay, that's homework for you guys. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the quadrants. And then quadrants means, quad usually means four. So the mouth 
what we do is we divide the mouth into four, especially when it comes to dentistry. So dividing the maxillary and mandibular arches into halves yields four sections, which are called quadrants. Each quadrant of permanent dentition contains eight permanent teeth and a quadrant of primary dentition contains five teeth because we said that primary dentition consists of 20 teeth, 10 on the top, 10 on the bottom. So if you divide 10 by two on the top, what do you get? Five and five, right? So on prim in primary dentition, a quadrant contains only five teeth. Now sextants. Sometimes it is necessary to divide the dentition into six parts, each called a sextant. So we have the maxillary right posterior, maxillary anterior, maxillary left posterior, mandibular right posterior, mandibular anterior, and mandibular left posterior. Anterior and posterior teeth, um, the anterior teeth are the incisors and the canines, which means it goes from number six to 11, okay? And 27, 22 to 27. So incisors means that they incise, which means that they cut into things because when we eat, ideally like when we eat a slice of pizza or a hamburger, what do we do to bite into the burger? Do we bite it with our back teeth or do we bite it with our front teeth? We bite them with our anterior teeth, which are in our incisors. They are usually visible when people smile. These teeth are aligned to form a smooth curving arch from the distal, which is the back of the canine on one side of the arch, to the distal canine on the opposite side. So when you run your tongue across the front of your teeth, you'll feel that your tongue does like an arch, a curve movement. Okay. The posterior teeth are the premolars, which are like the tiny molars in your mouth, and then the molars, which are the biggest teeth all the way in the back. The posterior teeth are aligned with little or no curvature, so they don't really curve. They're pretty much straightforward, just back. These teeth appear to be in an almost straight line. Okay, so what are the two sets of teeth that people have in their lifetime? What do we say they were? They were what? What are the baby teeth also known as? They are known as primary teeth. And then the teeth that we get as adults are considered to be permanent. Okay, so what is the term for the four sections of the divided dental arches? We said we divide the mouth into four. So what are these things called? What are these sections called? Quadrants. Yes, a quadrant is the term. Good job. Okay, what are the terms of the front teeth? What are the terms for the front and for the back teeth? What do we call the front teeth? Is there in the front there, they are what? Anterior. Anterior, good. And what's the name for the back teeth? Posterior. Good job. Okay, the types and functions of teeth. So human beings eat both meat and plants. To accommodate this variety in diet, teeth are designed for the cutting, tearing, and grinding of different types of food. So the permanent dentition is divided into four types of teeth. Okay, we set the incisors, which do what? They incise, right? They cut. And the canines, then the premolars and the molars. So the primary dentition has incisors, canines, and molars. Uh, kids that have primary dentition or baby teeth, they do not have premolars. Premolars start coming out once the kids um, start getting into their permanent teeth. There are no premolars in the primary dentition. So anytime that you see a picture of teeth, like a diagram of teeth, you can tell that if it's a primary uh, dentition because it doesn't have premolars, and of course it's only gonna have 10 teeth on the top and 10 teeth on the bottom. Now, if it's a, a permanent dentition, then you'll know because it, they have premolars on both sides and you'll have about 16 teeth on the top and 16, 16 teeth on the bottom. 
So incisors are single rooted teeth with relatively sharp, thin edges. Hence, you need those thin edges to cut. Located at the front of the mouth, the incisors are designed to cut food with the application of heavy force. Incisor means that which makes an incision or a cut. So when you when it, it tells when somebody tells you to incise something, it means you have to cut something. The tongue side or the lingual surface of the incisor is shaped like a shovel to help guide food into the mouth. So if it's shaped like a shovel, it means that it has a, a kind of like a curve. And if you touch the back of your anterior teeth with your tongue, you can feel that your teeth have a curvature. So canine teeth are also known as cuspids and canines are also known as the eye teeth. Uh, you, you'll hear some people call them that, the eye tooth, so you'll know that they're talking about their canines. They are located at the corners of the arch. The canines are designed for cutting and tearing food. They are the longest teeth in the human dentition, hence why they, uh, they're longer than the rest of your teeth and they look kind of like fangs. Um, the canine teeth have the longest roots of all teeth and are usually the last teeth to be lost. Like I said earlier, most of the time when a, when a child is transitioning, when they're in the mixed dentition, when they're transitioning from primary teeth to all permanent teeth, the last teeth that they will lose are usually their canines. Because of its sturdy crown and long root and location in the arch, the canine is referred to as the cornerstone of the dental arch. So the last four years that I worked in dentistry, um, I worked with a prosthodontist, which is a, 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 a specialist. He did dentures and, remo and partials, removables. He didn't do any fixed, um, uh, fixed bridges or crowns or anything like that. Although a prosthodontist can do that, but my doctor chose not to do that. He only did removables. So anytime that we used to see a patient that had like really bad teeth and a lot of their teeth had to be extracted and... Um, let's say we had to give the patient a partial, my doctor would always recommend the patient to try to save their four canines at least. If push came to shove and they can only save a few teeth, he wanted the patient to try to, at all costs, to save his canines because the canines are at the corners of the mouth. They have the longest root, so they're the most sturdy, and they're good to hold removables, to hold partials. So premolars, there are four maxillary and four mandibular premolars. The premolars, also known as bicuspids, are a cross between canines and molars. The pointed buccal cusp, and buccal means that it faces towards the cheek or the front of the face, holds the food while the lingual cusp, which means the cusp towards the tongue, grinds it. The premolars are not as long as canines, and also have a broader surface made for chewing food. And broader surface means that they're wider at the bottom, at the occlusal side. So molars are much larger than premolars, and they usually have four or more cusps. Uh, what they mean by cusp is like the mounds or the little mountains that you see on the molars, those are considered cusps. Uh, the function of the 12 molars is to chew or grind food. The molars have more cusps than do the other teeth. Four or five cusps on the occlusal, which is also the biting surface of each molar, depending on the tooth's location. Maxillary and mandibular molars differ greatly from each other in shape, size, and numbers of cusps and roots. Okay, so can anybody tell me um, which tooth is referred to as the cornerstone of the dental arch? Is it the canine? Good job, the canine. Can you tell me what are the five surfaces of the teeth? Oh my God. Mm. Okay. No. One is towards the face, one is towards the tongue. One is towards the midline, one is away from the midline, and one is on the chewing surface of posterior teeth. Remember what any of those are called? 
Are you referring to like um? I oh no, I forgot. Okay, so the surface of the anterior teeth that faces towards the your lips is called facial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the surface of the tooth that faces in the inside towards your tongue is called a lingual. And then the chewing surface of the back teeth, do you remember what that's called? Starts with an O. It's right on the slide, it's on the screen. Starts with an O? Mm hmm It's the biting surface of each molar. Occlusal. Yes, occlusal, okay. So do you remember what the surface towards the midline is called? The one that's pointing towards the midline. And remember, we said the midline is an imaginary line that goes straight up and down and like splits your your face and your mouth in two. Mm, not at the top of my head. So the surface that faces towards the midline is called the mesial. Mm -hmm. And then the surface that um, points away from the midline is called the distal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the way that I remember that is because if it says if it's pointing towards the midline, then it, it's pointing towards me. So I remember that it's mesial. So mm -hmm. if it's pointing away from the midline, what does that mean? What does away make you think of? Like distant. It's, yes, distant. So it's distal, and that's how I remember it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the two surfaces, like I was just saying, the facial, which is towards the face or towards the lips, lingual, which is towards the tongue, occlusal, which is the chewing surface of only posterior teeth, so premolars and molars, mesial, which is towards the midline, so, and then distal, which is away from the midline. So the anatomic features of teeth. Anatomic features of the teeth help maintain their positions in the arch and protect the tissues during mastication. There are three anatomic features, contours, contacts, and embrasures. So when we talk about contours, all teeth have a curved surface except when the tooth is fractured or worn. Some surfaces are convex and others are concave. So the way that I remember the two convex and concave, even if you don't remember what convex means, always remember that concave has the word cave in it. And what is a cave? What does a cave look like? Like a curve and it's on. Yes, there's a hole, right? If it's a cave, mm -hmm. it means that there's a hole. So there has to be like some type of curve. So mm -hmm. that's how I that's how I remember it, that concave means that there's like a curve, an indentation going in, okay? Mm -hmm. So the general principle that the crown of the tooth narrows towards the cervical line is true for all types of teeth. And cervical line means towards the gum. So the teeth are not shaped like a tic-tac, uh, they're not shaped like a chiclet gum. They're not completely squared. They're more wide towards the bottom, and then they're they narrow, they taper towards the gum, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so facial and lingual contours. The normal contour of a tooth provides the gingiva with inadequate stimulation for health while protecting it from damage that may be caused by food. So mesial and distal contours, these contours provide normal contact and embrasure form. And contact just means that two teeth are touching. That's the only thing that uh, contact means. So the height of contour, the bulge or the widest point on a specific surface of the crown. Contact areas on the mesial and distal surfaces are usually considered the height of contour on the proximal surfaces. Facial and lingual surfaces also have a height of contour. And you probably won't hear this in the office, but good to know. Embrasures. So when two teeth in the same arch touch, 
their curvatures next to the contact areas form space called embrasures. And that's like where you put your, uh, the toothpick in, like where you put the toothpick in between your teeth, that little space there, that's called an embrasure. FYI, toothpicks are not good for your teeth or your gums. So it's not a good idea to use toothpicks. Um, your best bet always is to use floss. An embrasure is a triangular space in a gingival direction between the proximal surfaces of two adjoining teeth in contact. Like I said, it's that little triangle space where some people decide to put um, a toothpick in. That's the embrasure. embrasure. Embrasures are continuous with the interproximal spaces between the teeth. All tooth contours, including contact areas and embrasures, are important in the function and health of oral tissues. Okay, so do you remember what is the name of the area where two adjacent teeth physically touch? What that area is called? If something is touching, that means what? That they have what? That they have contact, right? If you have contact with somebody, it means that you, you're in touch with them. Okay, so angles and divisions of teeth. Line and point angles are used only as descriptive terms to indicate specific locations. A line angle is formed by the junction of two surfaces, named from the combination of the two surfaces that join. Then a point angle, the angle is formed by the junction of three surfaces at one point, named from the combination of surfaces that form them. Divisions into thirds. Each tooth surface is divided into imaginary thirds to help identify a specific area of the tooth. Okay, so the root of the tooth is divided into the apical third. Do you remember what, what apical means? Do you remember what the apex of the tooth is? or where it is. I think that was uh, one of the survey terminologies for today. The, the apex, any time that you hear the apex, it means that that's the opening of the root of the tooth where the nerve goes in through. So that's the apical third. Then the middle third, it's pretty self-explanatory, is the middle section. And then the cervical third, is the, the section of the tooth that's towards the gums. Uh, yes, towards the gum. Crown of teeth, occlusal cervical division, crosswise divisions parallel to the occlusal surface, mesial distal division, lengthwise division in a mesial distal direction, and buccal lingual division, lengthwise division in the labial or buccal lingual direction. We'll almost never hear this unless you're working with a periodontist, which is a gum or bone specialist. So now we're going to talk about the um, the occlusion and malocclusion. And occlusion, we said that is the relationship between maxillary and mandibular teeth when the upper and lower jaws are fully closed and relationship between teeth in the same arch. So it, which means that if your mouth is completely closed, your upper molars should touch your lower molars. Your upper premolars should be touching your lower premolars. Centric occlusion occurs when jaws are closed in a position that produces maximal stable contact between occluding surfaces of maxillary and mandibular teeth. And notice how they say occluding surfaces, which means uh, the occlusal, which means posterior teeth, okay? Functional occlusion or physiologic occlusion is contact of the teeth during biting and chewing movements. Mal-occlusion is abnormal or malpositioned relationship of maxillary teeth to mandibular teeth when they are in centric occlusion. And you'll learn a lot about that, um, especially if you do, if you go into the orthodontist uh, specialty, you'll hear a lot about that. So angles classification used to describe and classify occlusion and malocclusion. 
The basis of the system is that the permanent maxillary first molar is the key to occlusion. It assumes that the patient is occluding in a centric position, meaning that they're occluding correctly. Classes of malocclusion. Um, class one, which is neutral occlusion, is an ideal mesiodistal relationship exists between the jaws and the dental arches. Mesial buccal cusp of the permanent maxillary first molar occludes with the mesial buccal groove of the mandibular first. So basically your teeth are like puzzles. If you close um, with your back teeth, your teeth should feel like they're all touching pretty much at the same time. And that means that your upper molars are fitting into the grooves of the lower molars. It should feel like everything is touching pretty much at the first at, at the same time. It shouldn't feel like one side is touching um, before the other. So class two is disocclusion, which means that the mesial buccal cusp and mesial buccal means that the cusp towards the front, towards the midline, that's touching your cheek of the maxillary first molar occludes by more than the width of a premolar, mesial to the mesial buccal groove or mandibular first molar. Frequently gives the appearance of protrusion of the maxillary anterior teeth over the mandibular anterior teeth, which means that the maxillary teeth cover the the maxillary anterior teeth cover the mandibular anterior teeth. Isn't that overbite? It is. Well, it, it there's like a certain degree to overbite because mm -hmm. even people that have had braces, when you close your mouth your upper teeth are always going to cover a little bit of your lower teeth in the mm -hmm. front. Your teeth on the front and the back are never going to touch end to end. That's not a correct bite. Mm -hmm. You'll find that out once you get into, um, once you get into the field, you'll see that a lot, especially if you go into ortho, you'll know it. Yes, it's an overbite, but there has to be an extent for it to be considered a, an overbite. Yes, because I used to have that. Did you have braces? I did. I had like two years and a half. Yeah, braces usually correct that. And overbite usually um, usually comes about um, if you suck your thumb, if you mm -hmm. use a pacifier for a long time, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the divisions of class two malocclusion. So there's division one, which the lips are usually flat and parted with the lower lip tucked behind the upper incisors. Maxillary incisors are labial version. The division two means that the maxillary incisors are not in labial version. Maxillary central incisors are nearly normal anter anterior posteriorly, and they might be slightly in lingual version. Class three malocclusion. Uh, the body of the mandible must be in an abnormal mesial relationship to the to the maxilla. Frequent frequently gives the appearance of protrusion of the mandible, and that means that it looks like your your jaw is more forward than your upper jaw. So that's why it gives the illusion of protrusion. Protrusion means it's it's like popping out. Stabilization of the arches. Closure, which anterior teeth are not designed to fully support occlusal forces on the entire dental arch. So as the jaw closes, the stronger posterior teeth come together first. And that's like I said, when, you, when you're closing with your back teeth, when your back teeth are touching, your front teeth are not touching end to end. So curve of speed is the occlusal surfaces of the posterior teeth do not form a flat plane. The curvature formed by the maxillary and mandibular arches in occlusion is known as the curve of speed. The curve of Wilson, cross arch curvature of the posterior occlusal plane. Downward curvature of the arch is defined by line drawn across the occlusal surface of the left mandibular first molar. So that kind of means that the, the, the back teeth kind of go like down. 
on a downward curve, not really uh, like on a stabilized flat curve. So now we're talking about the tooth numbering system and the numbering systems are used as a simplified means of identifying the teeth for charting and descriptive purpose. So like I said, when you go into the dental office, more than likely, I would I want to say like over 90% of the time, you're going to hear about the universal or the national system of numbering teeth, which starts with the number one and ends in the number 32. There's also an international standard organization system, and then there's the Palmer notation system. The universal national system is used most often in the United States. And like I said, the permanent teeth are numbered from one to 32. The numbering begins with the upper right third molar and works around to the upper left third molar. Then numbering drops to the lower left third molar and works around to the lower right molar. So the good thing about the universal syst numbering system is that even if there are teeth missing, those spaces still pertain to those teeth numbers. So let's say because number one, the tooth number one is the third molar, which is a wisdom tooth, most people don't have their wisdom teeth. So regardless if the patient has the wisdom teeth or doesn't have the wisdom teeth, the space for that first molar is always going to be number one. So you're going to start counting from number two, even if that tooth, if the third molar is not there. And that's the good thing about it. It doesn't change whether the tooth is there or not there. International Standards Organization System, the ISO or FDI system uses a two-digit tooth recording system. First digit indicates the quadrant, and then the second digit indicates the tooth within the quadrant, with numbering from the midline toward the posterior. And lastly, there's the Palmer notation system. Each of the four quadrants is given its own tooth bracket made up of a vertical line and a horizontal line. A shorthand diagram of the teeth presented as if one is viewing the patient's teeth from the outside.